Hi, and welcome uh, to this episode of the uh, podcast. Uh, today's guest is a uh, is a guest from from Ireland. It's Dr. Kieran O'Sullivan. Um, Kieran is is world renowned. I don't think that's that's uh, that's an under underestimate of what he's been known for. He's done like heaps of research. He's been involved in in clinical practice as well. And um, he's actually also been involved in free online services such as the uh, the paynet.com, which you've been doing with other clinicians as well, Kieran. But that's like some would say that's the boring part of the presentation. Who who's Kieran O'Sullivan? Uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks for the generous introduction. So um I qualified, I'm based in Ireland, as as you know. Uh, I qualified as a physiotherapist 23 years ago, which um, if we were, if the video is being shown on this would explain the hairline situation as it is at the moment. Um, and, you know, I suppose like a lot of teenagers, I went into physio because I was interested in sport. And my picture of sport was that that was around sports physio and massage. And I played a lot of sport myself at the time. And then I think like a lot of people, when I went through college, while I had some great lectures, it wasn't what I was expecting, and I didn't really like it. And when I first qualified, I, can, I actually think I would have left the profession because I, I liked the people I worked with, but I wasn't really clear on what my role was. I didn't really understand why these people said these weird things when they had pain. You know, they didn't behave the way they were meant to meant to behave. Um, and I think if I had been more creative or brave, I would have left the profession, but I didn't have a good plan B. And so I persisted for a little bit and I ended up going over to Australia, meeting some good people over there. And that kind of got me a bit more interested in physio. And so over the years then, I've probably um, become more convinced that there are things we can do to help people. And so while I can expand and I've worked in a few different places, I'm now back in Ireland, mostly based in the university, doing a mix of teaching, research and increasingly administrative stuff that causes me to lose even more here. Um, but other than that, yeah, that's probably the best summary I can give for now. Okay, that's a bold move. Stay get going into the administrative parts, Kieran. Yes, uh, and and you know, so, so I think for example, sometimes in whether you're running your own private practice or uh, working in a hospital or, or in a university, you're always going to have some of those roles. And sometimes people really like them and are good at them. I'm probably doing them because somebody's got to do them, you know. And I, I think it's it's important that these things are done well. But I wouldn't pretend that it's a particular strength of mine. I'll put it like that. Yeah, yeah. Now I normally brag about my colleagues that does that part very well, so I can do the teaching and a bit of, of curricular development. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, but I, uh, you know, somebody's got to do it. So uh, I'll I'll do these things. It's a, it's a part of most jobs nowadays but i do feel for example in the same way that i don't think we should try and bracket ourselves as solely teachers or clinicians or researchers or administrators it's probably good that we have an experience of these things but equally over time there are people that are better at some things so for example yeah. in our university a lot of these positions leadership management positions rotate there is some value in that but then equally i've seen in other institutions you have permanent heads of department who are actually very skilled at that and stay in that position for 15, 20 years. And I do think there is value in that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. So you didn't really uh, find it that interesting, the profession. So that kind of leads me to, um, to was, when was there like a, any light bulb moment in, in that pathway going f when you graduated 23 years ago? Why is there one or two episodes or or educational things you've done or or clinical things you've done that was like, okay, now this really interesting, this got me motivated, this kind of mm. got me changing? For me, so for me, without a doubt, the big thing was going to Curtin University in Australia and um being exposed first of all to a postgrad cert I did with uh, manual concepts, Toby and Kim from manual concepts, and then going back and doing a master's degree there. And I, I would be certain that I still made loads of mistakes in the years after that, but it really got me interested in the profession and I was exposed to really great people who still thought differently. So, of course, the famous and late Bob Elvey and indeed Max Zussman. And then, of course, probably the biggest influence on my professional career, people like Peter O'Sullivan. And it was great for me to see that actually there was a lot of science behind some of the pain physiology that I hadn't seen. But equally understanding how we could take some very technical language, which Max Zussman, of course, was very knowledgeable about, but then apply that in a clinical setting. And again, I think I left that situation saying, so 
that I suppose master degree saying, I really don't know how we can fix, was probably the word I was thinking of at the time, how we can fix or help these people. But I think I have a better understanding of why they're sore and why they're seeing these other things about being tired or sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, there's probably for me, there was a, would we say multi-steps, but two very different steps initially, understanding why people with pain say some of the things they say and experience some of the things they do. And I think, think in 2004, that was probably a big step change for me in terms of understanding it. But again, even now, tw another 20 years on, being confident that we can change these things or change them easily is, is still a big, big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you're not the first person that's done something postgraduate and, and found that that it changed the perspective or it broadened it. And not not only like in in um in what we would say um <clears throat> at curtain but in general when when people go on they they normally like get get motivated yes and and there are, again i suppose what i think was great about those i found to credit at master's programs that they involved supervised clinical placement which is something we do pre-qualification but not yeah. necessarily after qualification and it's very stressful you know like uh, some people might find it easy i definitely didn't um, but again, I do think it's actually a huge part of learning and we can talk about it in a while, but I think it's probably one of the big things we've got to do when we think about continuing professional development, like yeah. with the best of intentions, you and I having this conversation, it might open people's minds a little bit, change a few beliefs, but we'd be naive to think this will change anybody's practice. Changing their practice will be much more about seeing patients with a mentor, getting feedback, reflecting on it even viewing the videos or the audio themselves and and, and revisiting it. But um, so that's why I think rather than any other, even for example, when I did a PhD, I learned loads about, I suppose, the broader back pain literature, um, but I don't think it would equally on its own have changed my clinical practice without that supervised mentoring and all that kind of feedback. Yeah, no, I went through the same process and it's definitely like the supervision part was, was really important. Like, to change hmm. and, and, and change and the interest it is and it's it's something you know that i think is really important for the profession but equally making these things sustainable is really hard like even in we'll say relatively small countries like ireland um a couple of institutions have tried running those kind of programs but actually they they're very expensive getting good tutors takes time and money and so making them sustainable is a big challenge yeah yeah it, it's a huge problem well, let's go. Let's um, let's go a, a bit further. And we, what I would really like you is like um, because I thought you you'd had some some ideas and perspective. Let's like take the bigger lens today, Kieran. Um, that's of course it's a big word, but like uh, if we look at low back pain, spinal pain in in general, the management of that. Um, if you look a bit on a on a on a uh, with a with a negative perspective on it, um. It doesn't really look that good because we still see it's on the rise and it's one of the, the major reasons for people seeking care, especially in primary care. Um, why do you think we kind of haven't, um, we haven't like seen a decline in that? Why, why aren't we better at managing spinal pain? Can you sure. So one thing for sure is we can't say that the outcomes are much better societally. You know, there is at, it is at least as bad or getting worse over time. I'll give you a couple of different possibilities. First of all, at least until recently, we haven't even understood the basics of why people are sore. I do think we're getting a much better sense of that when we look at the, the what we'll call the broad biopsychosocial model, but the idea that there can be biological contributors from tissue damage to systemic inflammation, as well as the, you know, broadly accepted psychosocial factors to use that broad term. In other words, a range of different things can happen within a person's kind of physiology that make them vulnerable to pain. And these things are not necessarily easy to change. So at least we understand that. But then we haven't really developed interventions that are particularly effective. And then of the interventions that look the most effective or the most promising, they are not necessarily the ones that are promoted or funded very well. So, you know, I would hope if we skip forward, if, you know, the biopsychosocial model and its implications for pain are probably, there's been people talking about it for a few decades. Yeah. But if you look at the guidelines, it's probably only inconsistently in guidelines for about two decades, if that makes sense. 
two or three decades. So it's still relatively early days. And so now the guidelines are saying similar things, but we haven't really developed interventions that are scalable and are properly funded, if that makes sense. And so the system then ends up funding stuff that is probably um, all, not all that effective. So to give you one example, we could talk about back pain or knee pain. It's in many countries, at least in Ireland and probably in Denmark and many places, easier and cheaper to get maybe a um, steroid injection from your GP, anti-inflammatories, x-ray, MRI, maybe arthroscopy for the knee, <clears throat> and you might even get rehab post that arthroscopy, then to get a like a supervised program of sensible rehab, especially if that rehab might involve someone to help you with weight loss or your mental health or your sleep. And until... So we, we've definitely made mistakes for sure, but at the moment, the most promising interventions are relatively underfunded. And I could spend quite a while complaining about that. <laughs> no, I think you're, you're, you're touching on something interesting there because because I, I agree that it seems to be underfunded and that access has changed to other interventions. Yes. But, <clears throat> I think that's, that's, that's quite obvious. But, but the thing is also that that it seems that we're still sometimes seeing research being published. Uh, and we all know that an RCT is quite an expensive thing to do. And we're still seeing that where, where they, uh, we, we could come with, with multiple um, pitfalls in, in one of those, but we're still seeing those uh, like using different interventions, despite that we've seen in the past that this, is, this intervention hadn't really shown anything promising. Mm. Like it seems like to be driven by more like I need to do another research paper instead of looking at what does the evidence say and let's apply some of that. I know the evidence is not that good for interventions, but it mm. doesn't get better by repeating things that shown not to be effective. Yeah, or even the things that we know are modestly effective but have been well established. So, for example. If we look at the, look, Jill Hayden and her broad group have done a series of reviews over the years on the benefits of exercise for back pain, or you know, it could be applied to pain in general. And I don't know how many trials were up to at this stage, it's probably around 200 trials in the latest review. And it's showing across 200 trials, exercise helps a little bit. It doesn't help a lot. It doesn't do nothing. It helps a little bit. Um, and so on that basis, I don't think we need another trial of whether exercise helps back pain, unless it's doing something very different and looking at, <clears throat> sorry, let's say parameters around dosage or, you know, variations across response profiles or something like that. But of course, uh, you know, in the same way that I could say clinicians sometimes have a conflict of interest between um, the patient will bring money. So if I keep treating the patient and give them what they want, that will, you know, subsidize me. Researchers have conflicts of interest as well. And so if I was looking at a grant and I'm putting in an application, what might make the biggest impact on back pain or society or clinical practice mightn't be the most fundable and feasible. And for my CV, it's easier for a university to look at the number of grants, the number of euros or dollars I earn. And so there's a there's a conflict of interest within that as well. So researchers should, in theory, be thinking of the biggest impact for the professions, you know, for the health service. But of course, a lot of the time, something that's nice and simple and involves one piece is more measurable. So doing a study compared, looking at cycling for back pain compared to not cycling, that's nice and easy and clean and measurable. Um, I'm not saying it's a terrible study to do, but we kind of know what it'll show. Yes. And for me, there's much bigger questions around, like we'll say, if we look at something, staying within the exercise domain, there are a lot of people for whom exercise is not attractive or painful or fearful, or they live in a part of the city where there are no nice, clean, safe, cheap places to exercise. Yeah. And even if we stay within an exercise, I'd be more interested in studies looking at getting that group of people to do exercise or another evidence-based treatment. But again, that gets a bit more messy because you're into... Like, unfortunately, without trying to be judgmental, those people are more likely to drop out of your study. And yeah. if you have if you have somebody reviewing your study, your study will get better rated if you have 95% retention. And yeah. one surefire way to do that is only include relatively healthy people that are not very sore. So as a reviewer of grants, <clears throat> I will regularly have grants coming through where people will say back pain costs billions and billions of euro. And then you get down to their inclusion criteria, and they say, well, you should fund us because we will save billions. 
but my inclusion criteria are nobody with depression or previous surgery or opioids or sick leave. And you realize they're only including the people who are not costing lots of money. Yeah. Um, but I've seen myself in our studies, and it is a real challenge, if you try and generalize it to the more difficult people, which is absolutely what I need to do, it is harder to keep them involved in your study. And that, of course, complicates your results and so on. Yeah, yeah. And I think <clears throat> that's like more an academic perspective on it. And I think if you like, if you said, it, yeah, it's been consisting guidelines for two decades now. I, I, I also think that there's something in the way we've kind of put up the structure in the in the clinical world. Like, for example, I've started working, or I've been in the clinical world for 17 years, but the last five or six months, I've been at a GP's clinic and seeing clients there and the codes we have to give the patient when we see them we have to code them they don't seem that aligned with current knowledge either so we would we would apply like diagnose codes which so disc degeneration or faster joint type things yeah stuff like that which we would like normally not use because it's not up to current knowledge or our ability to diagnose that Mm -hmm. So that again, like if it's in the if it's in the system, you have to use every day for 30 or 40 hours a week. I mean, this so it, it's of course it's a bigger picture than just like nailing one thing, but I think there's so many places to start to make changes, but you kind of need to be willing to make that change and you kind of need to recognize that that change needs to be made on several <laughs> levels, both academia yeah. and into research. Yeah, and even oh, the, point you raised, uh, the point you raised there on uh, Brian on databases and how we enter data is important because you know there's always a new. I'm not I'm not against technology. I should say first of all, but you know every week there's a new machine learning algorithm or artificial intelligence app that's going to change the world of healthcare. But if you think about what you've described there and similar things happen in Ireland, what what good is that data being entered? You know, like we'll say nobody really thinks that, you know shoehorning somebody into a facet joint degeneration box and not considering comorbidities or you know health literacy or their mental health and sleep and activity and all that nobody really thinks that will be useful but if you have fifty thousand people with those codes the machine learning won't be able to do anything with it we need to have good data and then of course scale it up and use sophisticated technology to evaluate that but my sense is in loads of countries there is data being collected but it's not that useful and, and even not that valid. And it was designed with the best of intentions, but changing these systems is, is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's extremely hard. Yeah. And it's missing out on a lot of points. Also because we see that those there's there's a, there's a huge difference than those people seeking care. Because those can, can master it already and those that, that are searching for more answers. Yeah, for sure. Um so I suppose, and look, this we touched on this, I suppose, before, but that idea that, that categorization of people into discs or facets and other tissue-based disorders, that reflects the bias that's out there on the bio, you know, um, in, within the biopsychosocial model. And I've heard some people talk about how, you know, it's almost been neglected. I don't see that at all in the patients I see. I, I rarely, I can, I use one or two specific examples. We have one or two of them on our website, painnet.com, of where a biological contributor to pain was missed, but it's glaringly obvious. Somebody had a major trauma, suspected fracture, and was missed. What I see overwhelmingly is that people are ignoring the other contributors and attributing most of the pain to the bio factors. Whereas I think what we're going to need to do over the next 10, 20, 30 years is look at how these things connect. So there might be the bio in terms of there might be, yes, a disc herniation, yes, a fracture, modic changes, but also look at the bio in terms of the physiological changes. So low-grade systemic inflammation linked to things like stress, sleep, adiposity, low fitness, and so on. So that rather than categorizing them as the bio is one thing and these psychosocial are way over here, yeah. what we see over time with neck pain and even cardiovascular disease and mental health is that these things aggregate and, and, and combine. And that's why I, I keep going back to that analogy I use with patients around getting cold sores, that, you know, cold sores do have a biological contributor. There's a real virus. And, it, and without the virus, you're not getting a cold sore. But on its own, it's not enough. And so I don't think I, I can recall seeing many people with back pain where there was no biological contributor, where there wasn't at least some initial local inflammation, some degenerative changes, 
Um, and that would apply to other body regions. I don't think I see many people with shoulder pain in their 50s or 60s without some rotator cuff pathology, you know, yeah. or changes in morphology. But it doesn't explain it on its own. And it's when we look at their conditioning, their strength, their fear, their mood, their sleep, all these things. But go, and if we go back to, I suppose, the initial problems you mentioned there around CPD, CPD is a bit messy when you talk about training people to evaluate across eight or 10 or 12 parameters. It's much easier to say, here's my mobilization technique or my exercise program or my weight loss program. Yeah. But if you talk to GPs where you are, for example, they'll be highly aware of the interactive nature of some of these complaints. The people they see with irritable bowel happen to overlap quite a bit with their chronic fatigue and the back pain and the mental health. Yeah. But um, it's hard to change them. And I guess I've had some feedback from people saying, well, what you're describing is very complex and therefore it's too complicated and too hard to change and it'll cost too much money. And I can see where they're coming from, but I think they're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so um, just to make sure that, I, that, that, that I'm getting this right, or I think I might be getting it wrong. So that's why I'm trying to expand on it. So you don't you don't buy the perspective, Kieran, that there's been too little research into you need to understand more of a biological things, or we need to under, be better at identifying a biological things if we need to be able to find an intervention to that. Yeah. So I, I suppose if I divide them into two, I would say we still need to better understand biological physiological variables by that i mean what drives low-grade systemic inflammation that we see what drives central sensitization and or whatever we're term we're calling on these but essentially the biological biological aspects of why people are sensitive to movement and irritable and so on but what i don't think we need huge amounts more of of course it'll happen but do we do we really need lots more uh, investment on large imaging studies either cross-sectionally or prospectively I even in those with what might be called specific pathology. So, for example, if you look at the, the teenage boys, typically with PARS defects or bone marrow edema changes, you know, even amongst that, what would have at one point been considered a specific pathology, you can see over time that a small proportion of those will never heal. That fracture or PARS defect never heals. And we've seen over time that even in those very specific pathologies, the rate of injury or back pain in the future is no different whether your fracture or PARS defect heals or not. Um, so in any of the stuff we've seen, you know, so for example, if you tell me I have unlimited money, I'll say, yeah, do every study manual and include all the imaging studies and all the arthroscopy studies and all that. But there is a gaping hole in terms of the chronic long-term management of lots of these um, conditions. And if you look at all the guidelines, they all talk about this thing about self-management and repeated thing we hear from patients. And I think it's accurate is that the health service is saying self-management. What we're seeing is abandonment. You know, they're saying you've had this problem for 10 years. I'm going to give you a leaflet and now you're going to figure this out on your own. Yeah. Uh, and then they, or we might give you maybe three or four weeks of a little class. And in no other chronic condition do we do that. So if you look at diabetes. Typically with diabetes, there will be a, 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 a medical assessment and you might be given some medicine and you'll be given some lifestyle advice. But nobody thinks when somebody, let's say a kid is diagnosed at eight or 12 or 14, that we're going to treat them intensively for six weeks and then they never come near healthcare. And if they do, the initial management failed. Whereas that seems to be our assessment, our, our approach to back pain at the moment. If you go for rehab and if at any point in the next three years you ever get back pain, the initial treatment is a failure. Whereas for, and you can make the same about people with mental health problems. Yeah, I would like to think that if somebody has anxiety or depression in their twenties and we give them an intense, you know, period of treatment for two three months, that they will never be worried or feel low again in their life. But do we really think that's realistic? Yeah. In fact, what's much more likely is we give them an intensive period to get them started. Well, we try and set up the healthcare system. Not that they're always coming back but that they have skills that they can hopefully manage themselves, but also that if they need a top-up at some point, we can give them more light touch top-ups. And you know, that can be in groups, can be telehealth, it can be in lots of forms. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't see, or I see very few interventions being targeted in that way for back pain. And again, we could broaden it out to MSK pain in general, because yeah. they're 
they're, they're even they're not as um sexy so when we look at you know it's much sexier to say here's my stem cells my app my watch my monitor yeah um and you know we've learned a lot from covid in other ways but even if you look at the interventions that were trialed and you know uh, i'm delighted with the efficacy of some of the things we've looked at in terms of the vaccines but look at how much was pumped into the pharmacological interventions and how many studies did you see out there on distancing ventilation masks yeah. not anywhere near as many no so it, it comes back to like if we need to change this we need to start to reframe it also in the public because what when people come to us they ex they they expect they have a different view on what they need sometimes and that that goes very much into you need to take this injection you need to do this specific thing because i found this specific thing that this would work with yeah and and i think we've we fail the public in that regard in that, you know, I sometimes say to people when I'm doing a course with them, you know, let's say there's me with 20 or 30 physios, osteos, chiropractors in a room. And I ask them, what do you think a group of the public who saw us uh, studying back pain, what do you think they would think we're talking about? And and generally the conversation turns into, well, the public probably think we're talking about posture, the safe way to lift, um, good chairs and maybe exercise. Yeah, uh, there would be very little expectation amongst the public that we'd be talking about the downsides of imaging, or yeah. you know the 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 um the importance of looking at the bigger picture, the broader stuff around your family relationships, work, and so on. And so for a lot of people, it sounds a bit crazy. And one of the challenges we have currently is that you and I are probably talking a similar language, but for a patient, it's amazing how many times, even now, and I don't see that many patients now, but even now. How many times a person says, you're the first person that ever asked me about any of that stuff, or equally, that allowed me to talk about that stuff because there was time. Because again, here we are, it can sound like we're being quite critical of clinicians, but if you've got somebody with a very long, complicated problem, getting all the, the relevant information out of them in 30 minutes is not really achievable or realistic. So we have to set up our system so we allow not unlimited treatment, obviously, because, you know, over-treatment and, and all that is a big problem in one sense, but we've got to be able to take a detailed history. And that sometimes includes stuff that patients think is irrelevant. So lots yeah. of people will still come in thinking, well, the most important thing is that here knows about my scan and he knows, you know, about some other biomechanical factor. And that's relevant, but it's by no means the most relevant. Yeah, but it's also relatable for the, for the patient. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in any way irrational or silly or, or crazy. It makes perfect sense. That's the paradigm in which we were all raised. I used to have, again, one of the reasons I started studying back pain was I used to get a lot of back pain. And yeah. I was told at the time, and I honestly believed it was because I played a lot of sport. And then um I had an MRI scan because that's always a good thing, obviously, and it showed um disc bulge and pressure on a, on a nerve root and it showed a cyst and I wasn't sure what a cyst meant but it sounded a bit scary and I went down the path that lots of people would in terms of getting loads of treatment I was very what I would have said at the time was I was very compliant and I was very diligent I would now call that hyper vigilant and avoidant in terms of I <laughs> we did endless amounts of rehab before work lunchtime in the evening I spent all my time being very careful to not injure my back but of course, now I look back on other factors that were going on in my life at the time and how I respond to the pain, and it's very different. So it, again, my res my response at the time, and I was qualified physio at the time, I wouldn't say it was stupid, it was rational, but it was wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it can be quite a learning experience having pain. Mm, yeah. it, it honestly can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, which to some extent, I've, I've learned to appreciate that. I think it's it's nice that it's on occasionally brings up as long as it doesn't interrupt life for too long. Yeah. And, and, and again, if we look at even public beliefs around back pain, the best beliefs are generally by people who've had back pain and recover. So, yeah. you know, the public has poor beliefs around back pain. Those who have back pain and it never recovered have the worst, but people who've had back pain and it's settled have better beliefs than people on average. So experiencing something and moving on is actually quite affirming. And I think again, in the clinical setting, having people, even if they're doing well, having a relapse or a flare-up and recovering from it and managing it ideally on their own, that's that's really positive, as long as they understand that that's not a sign that all the rehab has failed and therefore they must now reconsider going down the spinal cord stimulator route. Yeah, yeah, it needs to be put into context. 
exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> as again, we, we've kind of uh, touched on it already regarding that easier access to MRIs, uh, uh, drugs, um, injections, and stuff like that. But I also think the the word of over medicalization, Kieran, that has sometimes, or at least if you look at at my interpretation of social media, that has led to what I would call a neglect sometimes that anything gets better on its own. We we don't really, we just need to make sure that uh, we're doing our triage and then everything is like fine. Where I think that that neglect from my perspective sometimes that that takes away some valuable information and some valuable learning, both for me as a clinician and the client. Because when I'm doing an, an, an old school examination, including a history taking, uh, I might be, be palpating, I might be doing some movement and stuff like that. I can use that information because the patient experienced that and put that into context and have a conversation regarding that. Yeah. And I think that's so important part instead of, well, it's nothing serious and it, it's not a radiculopathy you'll be fine in six to eight weeks, but we know that fine in six to eight weeks mean a decrease in pain and and not necessarily it's all gone in six to eight weeks. They still have like pain on a scale from zero to 10. There's an average in around three. Hmm. So I think it's a fair point because you know we're all agreeing that overall, not just around imaging and surgery, but there is there has been probably all over treatment on average of people with pain. Yeah. Um, but the, most of the harms come from surgery, the meds, the imaging, all that kind of stuff, the harm and the cost. Where it becomes tricky is how we decide how how quickly do we escalate. So if we look at the evidence, we know some people thankfully will recover very quickly, and some people, unfortunately, the symptoms will linger. Yeah. And there's probably general agreement when I talk to people around the globe that at some point, and this is the hard part, at some point. Some people need something more than just the reassurance and self-management. But what there isn't agreement on is, what is that point? You know, is that after two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? And then some people, how do we identify those people? Is it based on a questionnaire, like a risk profiling thing? And then even if we agreed, well, let's say it's at six weeks, that's when you decide. And it's these people who score about X there is also a lack of agreement on now what's the something else? Is it more exercise? Do they then see a psychologist? No, no, now we go to see a strength conditioning person. And so for me, I'd be much more interested in studies that look at that, that at what point do we escalate from just the basic low risk management, you know, sensible advice to right. We don't want to ignore these people because, you know, there are a group of people that we shouldn't leave for two years on yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just, just advice. And I'd have to say, I'm not aware of any really strong evidence out there that tells me as a clinician, now, here you go, eight weeks, that's when you intervene and you go to step B of the of the five-step program, for example. Mm. The um, On the over-medicalization, something else entered my head there, head there as well, I suppose, just on that broader point then of, you know, how we reassure people. I think one of the things I've made... I think I've definitely made it and we've all made mistakes is that we forget what happens in our own life. So without delving into your relationships, Brian, I know that when my wife is annoyed, I find that when I say to her, calm down, strangely, she doesn't calm down. You know, <laughs> she's worrying about something. And I say, don't worry. You know, that in itself is not a very effective intervention. And I think we've forgotten that when it comes to patients that we sometimes think when we can probably with some confidence say this is not serious and it will be okay, we forget that it's not enough to say, don't worry, Brian, it's going to be fine. Yeah. And if we look at the quality of literature, one of the things I think we, you know, there's this whole debate about hands on, hands off. And I think one of the things that we probably forget sometimes is that if we want to reassure people, one of the things they really want is to be examined properly. Now, what does properly mean? I don't know. But when you dig into it, it usually involves something like somebody examining me and doing a bunch of tests and poking me in the back a little bit. Mm, now, yeah, fair point. so yeah. Now we both know. Do I do I learn a lot on average from looking at somebody's static posture? No. Are any of the special tests that we use for the lumbar spine any good? No. And if I poke somebody in the back, other than I can tell if they're tender in lots of places or in one, do I learn an awful lot? No. But I think it's part of that reassurance thing. And again, I'm proudly, I don't 
get sucked into the hands off hands off debate, but I'm definitely not in the hardcore manual therapy group. What I do think is part of that reassurance, we really have to remember the importance of examining them properly and properly is basically whatever the person thinks. Yeah. And unfortunately for some people, that will be, oh, properly means an X-ray or an MRI, you know? Yeah. But if we stick to the clinical exam, I think it's almost a waste of time and it can backfire if I start explaining things to somebody and reassuring them before they feel qualitatively they've been examined properly. And I think it's one of the reasons why students and clinical placement, even when they, you know, they're barely competent, they know some theory, but haven't had much experience. Well, they often get good feedback from patients because they do 101 clinical examination techniques, most of mm -hmm. which have no validity, but they, you know, there is no doubt that the patients often feel they've been thoroughly examined and yeah. nothing has been missed. They do the straight leg raise when it's not indicated at all, but you know, the person has been taken through that procedure. And for me, with that piece you're talking about there around the neglect, I think we should be doing less treatment. But I think before we send people off on the abandonment self-management route, we really want to kind of reassure them physically as well as psychologically, reassure them physically, not to be arrogant, but you know, I'm an expert clinician. I have done my tests. I can say with some confidence, there is no sign of whatever they're worried about, multiple sclerosis, cancer, infection, fracture. And therefore, I am confident we can start you on this path. But again, that's my instinct. Do I have strong evidence that that would, would improve it? No. And again, that's where I think we need to do, to look at some of those interventions, which haven't really been done. Like if I looked at, from the research perspective, two groups, both getting a reassuring self-management uh, approach, but one of them getting a very explicit objective examination with loads of confirmatory positive messages about the structure of their spine would we see a difference maybe we wouldn't mm. but I, I can't see much harm as long as we didn't go along and start scaring them about what we're feeling or what we're finding in the exam yeah and then that kind of leads me back i think it's tamar pinkus who looked at the cognitive and the effective um yes and, 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 and reassurance and was, right yeah it was lovely review and again she in that review and other people said the affective reassurance there's no harm in it but on its own is not as good as the cognitive so by yeah. all means be empathetic connect with the person but actually cognitively explaining to them about this not being harmful and why and again i suppose part of that is being seen as credible you know again unfortunately if you're a newly qualified uh physiotherapist osteopath chiropractor you might have many advantages but one of the disadvantages is you don't look like you've 20 years experience. I people look at me and think that I have 40 years experience because of the way I look. <laughs> but, like you know, <laughs> but you know, with 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 there are lots of advantages to being in your 20s, but sometimes even the fact that you look like you've been around the road for a while carries a little bit of credibility as well. Yeah. And we should use that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We we've kind of like um <clears throat> talked about it uh the over medicalization thing and the and the and the bio thing and i appreciate your perspective on that kieran um you're an institution that kind of educates people so you have an updated curriculum and on a regular basis we go through our curriculum and i know that in nottingham they've been going through their curriculum now um we kind of feel obligated also from an ethical standard that we have to have an updated curriculum and I guess it would be the same for, for your place in Ireland as well. A, a few years ago, um, there, was an, there was a study done looking at, so to speak, updated curriculums. And, and it was a bit frustrating that there was quite a few that wasn't updated, whatever updated means. Um, if we're looking at back pain in the big picture, what, what would be the interest in not updating your curriculum? Like having a really updated curriculum, looking into uh, palpation of viscera, um, explanations that aren't validated and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'll, it's a good question. I'll give you two different perspectives, one benign and one not so benign. One benign <laughs> perspective would be somebody could reasonably argue, let's say they were strongly of the opinion that um, lots of special hands-on tests and clinical tests were very useful and 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 all that they could reasonably make the argument that all this biopsychosocial stuff hasn't radically improved outcomes as we touched on earlier on you know it's not as if we can say that let's say what might be considered an old school manual therapy intervention is nobody could say it's radically inferior to a cbt program for example yeah so they couldn't make the argument that 
the the more contemporary interventions haven't blown it out of the water. And actually, they could make the argument that, you know, people value hands-on clinical skills, and actually it's a part of my professional identity as a caro, osteo, physio, etc. So that would be the benign inter interpretation. Uh, a more, a less benign intervention, uh, I suppose, um, aspect and that would be it's strongly tied into kind of um, conflicts of interest around professional identities that you know I if I if I'm going to justify my role in the multidisciplinary team or in my private practice I need to have a unique selling point um either whether that's manipulation or or more wacky left field stuff around palpating viscera or energy fields or anything else you want that there are there are commercial benefits to to selling some of these things so for example you know coca-cola and mcdonald's there's no sign that they're going out of business anytime soon and that you know like we take the kids to mcdonald's now and again and inter intermittently have coke so I'm, I'm not against them but i don't necessarily think that that means that they are the best drinks and foods available so being commercially successful and being healthy can be very very different things and so i think um and if I look at, you know, we have in, in our university and in lots of universities, we have very intelligent, capable students coming on these programs, but they will come on the program without necessarily interrogating the specifics of the modules, you know, yeah. before they come. they're coming on to do a physiotherapy degree. And and I think personally, it's always going to update your curriculum, but I'm less worried really about what's in the module handbooks or even what they're called. You know, I think there's probably some broadly been some improvements in almost the the frameworks to which people view the modules, but like, I don't care if there is a pain module or, or not. Some people will say it's a great thing to have a specific pain module. I don't really care. Or if there's a back pain module or if it's all integrated. But for me, the most of the learning will still happen on clinical placement. And so what for me is probably the biggest indicator of, you know, a good learning environment is when students go on placement, do the educators out there have some sense of what's being taught in the university and there's reasonably good communication between them so that you don't get the academics talking about, let's say it's very, this would be an unfair characterization, but let's say the university is talking about all evidence-based practice and nothing clinical and vice versa. The clinicians are doing loads of clinical stuff that isn't very evidence-based. That's a disaster. Uh, and it's hard for a student to kind of um, negotiate that environment. And so yeah. we've got to update the curriculum. We've got to look at you know all the learning outcomes and even how we assess students. I could get off on a big tangent around how to assess students in today's uh, machine learning world, but um, but for me, it's the quality of the relationship between the university and the placements, and are they talking the same language? And that's a real challenge because taking on students is stressful, and in a lot of countries, including Ireland, it, the people are doing it not for a, for loads of money. It's 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 sometimes part of their job, but a lot of the time it's out of goodwill. Yeah. No, I, th I think it's difficult. And I think <clears throat> our, our clinical placement places and, and us as an institution, um, I think we're doing our best not to be either or, but I can definitely hear our patients, oh, sorry, my our students when they come back and they would probably say the same when they go out in clinical practice that there's some discrepancy, that it all, doesn't always align perfectly. Yeah, and and like I think that's perfectly reasonable. If I think of the people who I have most in common with, we wouldn't do everything exactly the same. So no. some professional disagreement and discussion is fine. But when you have, for example, and I've seen this sometimes where you have, we'll say, people who strongly think we need to be very, very careful about protecting the body. That's a really hard belief to shake. So if you have, let's say, clinicians who feel with osteoarthritis, it's still pretty much around wear and tear of the joints and, and you need to protect the joints through avoidance and rest and being very cautious. It's very hard to make that compatible with somebody who feels we can, these tissues are not that badly damaged and we need to push them. And, and so for me, a lot of that in the pain sense, that how comfortable are, are your clinicians and your students with some pain or some discomfort and that pain doesn't always mean harm. Those basic messages, that's important. Yeah, yeah. And, and it brings some good discussion. So if we if we provide them the students with a system where we can discuss the 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 questions they have in regards to when it's not totally aligned, I think I think that's where a lot of the learning and the, the motivation and the interest within the field lies. Sure. And I think even, you know, it's staying away from the psychosocial stuff, even if we look at exercise, which is still and likely to be a key part of physical rehab for the next while. 
how we, if we use the word prescribe exercise or encourage exercise, is still likely to need a lot of nuance. So, for example, we will see patients and we will teach about them in the program who have hamstring injury, where the rehab is very much aligned with a strength and conditioning perspective, improving local tissue tolerance, progressing through strength to eccentric, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll have people who are getting exercise for their rheumatoid arthritis and their chronic fatigue and their fibromyalgia, where they're getting exercise, but the prescription or the framework is much more around behavior change and things like pacing and of you know addressing avoidance and so on yeah. and then you've got people post-op acl where you've got tissue healing and you're looking at excess prescription there um so there's lots of different even when we talk about a kind of a traditional intervention like excess how we pitch that and how we dose it varies a lot according to conditions and in fairness to students that can be confusing because if they if yeah. they what are the principles for excess progression? And, and I would say my own background, my excess prescription and strength conditioning skills would have been poor through my training and through my early years. And so I think it's encouraging that lots of physios are, are taking that on board in recent years and doing master's programs. And yet I'm very skeptical that that will have a meaningful impact on persistent pain. I think the only positive thing from that is probably it reduces fear of avoidance. I don't see the being able to prescribe exercise based off a one or M or a 10 or M really helping people with back pain that much. No. It's much more about the broader context. So take the message that exercise is good and safe and we can push the body. But other than that, the response of the body is not as predictable as, you know, a lot of S and C principles, which are based on how a healthy pain-free 18 year old responses to, to exercise. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it, it's easy if you, when you have less experience, um, that that then you have like a black and white principle that you could apply, and I think that provides with confidence, and then that kind of shows that you're more confident. And when you're more confident, your patient might feels more safe with you. So in yeah. that in that sense, it could kind of buy in to some it, extent. It is, and it's something I'm not sure I or we at the university have always got right. In that you know, when we talk about being critical thinkers. It is important, I think, as people are trained as physios, GPs, chiropractors, that they understand maybe this works quite well, this one we're not so sure about, and this really doesn't look like it's encouraging. I think that's good. And uh, But one concern I have is that through putting our students through these kind of evidence-based practice modules and critical clinical reasoning mo models, they become pessimistic that anything works. Yeah. And I think it almost explain my own initial kind of skepticism about the profession, because like, well, if nothing works, am I going to face 40 years of doing stuff that nobody thinks is any good? And I actually look sometimes with horror and envy at other professions, I won't name them, where they seem to think what they do is brilliant and they're full of enthusiasm. And in its own way, their confidence and enthusiasm alone explains some part of whatever benefit is experienced, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so what I'm not sure I've got right is I would like my students to understand, look, we need to be cautious about how effective this is and how certain we are. But I don't actually think I should be explicitly communicating to the patient, God, none of this stuff really works. We're just taking a chance here. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I would be much on this. And I, so like, you know, we can have sophisticated conversations around the importance of acknowledging uncertainty, but I actually disagree that communicating uncertainty and uh, in terms of the the advice is necessarily a good thing. I think as long as we're happy, we're not missing anything serious or dangerous. We need to tell people, you know, if we think it's actually a good option, that that there's reasons to be positive about that because your own body language says something about your confidence in that. And again, that's hard. To, if if you can fake that easily, that's not a good sign of you as a person. You know, you probably <laughs> need to believe in it. You know, and we want people who aren't just showmen or showwomen or salespersons, but people who think with some confidence, I've got, you know, I can, I can propose this and, and it's legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where do you, where do you like, um, what do you think the future holds for low back pain? That's a so, big one to do as a final yeah, question. I don't know that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you the pessimistic and the optimistic takes on it. In a pessimistic take, um, in lots of parts of the world, healthcare is becoming increasingly privatized. Private healthcare has a role, but it is it is strongly influenced by you know the commercial success of it. Yes. And so I don't see 
um, in many ways, including especially in private healthcare, the incentives to um, reduce overtreatment working. So if we give, to give you one example, the Keel Group, Jonathan Hill and Adrian Foster did that lovely start back trial in the UK. And yeah. it was one of the first and few trials to show slightly better clinical outcomes and also slight savings in money. So it might not have been huge, but like one of the few trials in a big study to show slightly better outcomes and save some money. And now that's been repeated twice in the United States by two different groups, and both studies showed absolutely nothing. And to me, that is just a sign. And in fact, if you look at the studies, it is typical of there were loads of perverse incentives where, for example, in the US, a very privatized healthcare system, in, if you had a lower risk patient in the UK, that was basically not given very much treatment, self-management advice, whereas in the US, there was strong incentives to keep that person in healthcare and to give them scans, especially if the GP owned the MRI scan and so on. And I see, you know, I suppose I'm still concerned that we'll say when you go to even lots of conferences, the people with the money uh, to support the conferences and have the stands and the talks and take the speakers to nice dinners are the drug companies, the medical device companies and, and the private insurers. So there's wrong reasons to be pessimistic around that because we haven't moved on in our societal understanding. Uh, even, for example, to finish on, one, uh, on, on the pessimism, if you think about the legal system, if you had two people going uh, involved in an accident in their workplace and they now had back pain, and one of them went in and they, the argument was made that they had disc degeneration and it was caused by lifting, they would probably get some compensation if there was yeah. any little ergonomic issue at all in the workplace. If another person, a coworker, went in with back pain and it was said they have back pain because they've been under stress at work and um, they haven't been sleeping well at night because of the stress at work, do we think they'd get the same level of sympathy or financial reward? Probably not, at least no. not in our world. So we've got that societal perspective still that there's legitimate organic back pain and this other Mickey uppy fluffy stuff. Yeah. But then to give you a more optimistic take. Can I can I just ask a question, Kieran? Yeah. Do you yeah. think do you think we need to look at different outcomes? Um, I think we think, probably think if we had a if we had a private system and yeah. I in the private practice, I I wasn't allowed to like to see patient if I didn't provide outcomes that could show that what we did was effective, it was cost effective, it changed disability. It might even change pain. Who knows? And the opposite. Yeah. Positive, positive side. I think. I think we. I think outcomes are always good if they're collected well. But to give you an example, so yes, my short answer is yes. But I'd be really careful about which outcomes. Yeah. To give you an example, uh, in in, uh, in 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 lots of countries, there have been studies looking at, for example, whether physios can reduce orthopedic uh, weightiness. Yeah. And physios do this very well. So instead of having, I'll make up a number, a thousand patients to see the orthopedic waiting uh, consultant, physios screen them, most of them. They decide that 90% of them actually just need physio or maybe, a, you know, uh, to see a rheumatologist. And the cons orthopedic consultant sees the main person. So that's if your outcome is reduce waiting lists to see the consultant, massive success. What about the clinical outcomes of those patients, though, or their, their management? What typically tends to happen then is they now join the massive waiting list of people in primary care physiotherapy or somewhere else, but their clinical outcome hasn't changed in the slightest. So it can be, so I think we need to look at the economic and the clinical in that regard. Looking at the more optimistic take, I guess my sense is things take time. And so if we look at GPs giving antibiotics for sore throats, you know, that was a big thing in the past. Now it's much less common. In fact, there's, you know, useful active yeah. resistance, you know, in those kind of situations. It didn't happen overnight, but it had to happen, first of all, through education, but specifically audit and evaluation. So, for example, in, in lots of jurisdictions now, if GPs are prescribing high rates of antibiotics, they'll actually get pulled in saying, you're referring way more than your co-workers. Uh, so we're not worried about individual cases, but if you're prescribing three times as many antibiotics as the person up the road, you know, you need to explain that. And so I think there's things can take time. And I think that's basically how we're going to try and change things like imaging of MRI, uh, imaging like MRIs and opioid prescriptions and that like education will only get us so far. There needs to be audit and there needs to be reward for good practice, sanction for not so good practice. And then equally, if we look at conditions like mental health, cardiovascular disease, obesity, pain, there's an increasing awareness that these things are connected. And whether they, then we need to talk about hospital-based interventions for 
considering these things together or community-based programs, I'm optimistic that we better understand how these things are connected. So even though we haven't massively improved outcomes, I am optimistic that it can be done. The question is, is there the will to do it? Because some people will say, listening to me, and I've had this feedback, what I'm proposing would take a lot of time. Like it's very hard to change what physios do and chiros do. We've been trained a certain way and it takes time. And this is true. It genuinely would to do it well. I think if you look at all of the coaching stuff or the teaching pedagogy, you don't give people a one-off podcast or a lecture and they transform what they do. It takes lots of time to become competent. But as far as I know, you know, I know a few pain medicine consultants and spinal surgeons, they didn't do that in a weekend course. You know, I'm pretty sure it involved many years of training and supervision and it cost a fortune. And so if we're dealing with something as big as chronic back pain and it costs huge amounts of money, yeah. we probably need to accept and invest in training physios and chiropractors and osteopaths and GPs to do this and pay them appropriately. And I think over time, I'd like to see insurance companies, governments stop paying professions. So stop paying for physio, but start paying for treatments. Um, and that's that could get contentious, but essentially we probably need to um, subsidize guideline-based care, whatever we call it, and start drawing people away from that. And if you really want, I would suggest any of Norton Hadler's books looking at how healthcare systems are funded. So his one stabbed in the back was excellent or worried sick on the American healthcare system because it's a particularly sick healthcare system. Yeah, yeah. But I think education, I used to think education would solve all these things, whereas now I think we can educate people, but then we also have to um, basically make it hard to do the wrong thing and make it easy to do the, the more sensible evidence-based thing. Yeah, that would be a really nice situation, Kieran. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and again, I, mean, like, I would be, it would be tricky because at some point, my autonomy as a clinician might be compromised a little bit, yeah. you know, but but then, you know, like all these things, they can be evolved and, and, and graduated over time. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, Thanks for your uh, for your points and views and and these things, Kieran. It's uh, it's really interesting and it, it's it's got me thinking. So I might email you a few questions afterwards <laughs> when I reflect a bit more. Um, so if people have found you you and this talk quite interesting, where can they find out more about uh, Kieran O'Sullivan? Sure. Um, so so, so uh, they I'm, don't I'm, find a page with with Peter or Solomon. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, they can if they Google University of Limerick and Kieran O'Sullivan. I'm in the Department of Allied Health or School of Allied Health. But more uh, simply, I'm on Twitter at Kieran O'Sull, K I E R A N O S U L L, and our website PainEd.com has a lot of resources. And again, the main thing people probably use that for is the patient stories section, because I sometimes find it useful when I'm explaining pain to a person to say, look, there's another example or two of people who sound a bit like you. Do you want to hear their story about how they recovered? Because mm -hmm. I've yet to convince a person with pain through showing them a systematic review or a forest plot or a trial. You know, explain, you know, that for me, it's never worked where it has worked is help them understand their own story if it makes sense for them, and then sometimes referring them to other real people so they, that they can relate to. Thank you, Kim. We put that in the in the show notes, and I, I'm sure this has been like really reflective for, for people listening. So just like final word, thanks again, Kieran. It's, it's, it's and, excellent. Uh, you, it's really delighted to have you and your experience on, the, on this podcast, sharing your time right. with us. And thanks for your time, Brian. It was very enjoyable. Good.